Hey everyone, it's Bryn, the host of The Birth Hour, and today we have a special episode for you. This is an episode of our partner podcast, which is an additional podcast that we do for our Patreon members at the co-producer level, which is $10 a month. My husband hosts this podcast and he interviews partners on their perspective of pregnancy, birth, and postpartum, and we release these episodes every single Friday. So if you're new to the birth hour, you may not know that we have a Patreon community. This is a group of supporters who are partnering with us to help promote the mission and message of the birth hour. Many of them have been with us for years, and we'd love to have you come join us over at patreon.com slash birth hour. We have a special going on right now for Black Friday where you can get two months free when you sign up for an annual membership. So what this means is that the partner podcast would be available to you for just $8 a month, in addition to all of our other perks, which include membership in our private Facebook group, which is just a wonderful community. And then also all of our archived episodes will be available to you. And everything that is available to our Patreon members becomes instantly available to you when you become a patron. So if you want to be binge listening partner podcasts over the holidays or our archived episodes, this is the time to do it. And these memberships start at just $5 a month. So with the two months free with an annual membership during Black Friday, you'll be getting it for just a little over $4 a month. So just think of it as, you know, buying me a nice cup of coffee and really truly you're just supporting my family and really helping make this podcast possible. So we would love to have you join us over at patreon.com. The Black Friday sale will be going through Monday and this is just a little sneak preview of one of the things you would get at that co-producer level which again would come down to about $8 a month if you do the annual membership. So in order to do the annual membership, you'll just go over to patreon.com slash birth hour and click on the link that says save 16% with an annual membership and everything will be taken care of over there. So we would love to have you join us and I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm going to turn it over to Richard and his guest, Andy. Welcome back to the Partner Podcast. Today's guest is Andy Caldwell. He and his wife, Anna, live with their three kiddos in London, and he shares about supporting Anna through each of those births. Their first birth involved a lengthy NICU stay, and their most recent occurred on the first day of London's first lockdown due to COVID-19. Andy offers great insights about being prepared for the unexpected, as well as being a strong advocate for your birth partner. Let's hear from Andy. Hi, Andy. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, Richard. Pleasure. Great to speak to you. You too. Uh, before we get started, will you tell me a bit about you and your family? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm married to Anna, live here in London, uh, right in the center of London. I've got three kids and my eldest is six. She's called Elara. Uh, my middle one is four. He's called Joan. Uh, not to be confused with Johan or other variants. And then my youngest is just six months old and he's Bodhi. He's a real, real little cutie. <laughs> I bet. And he was born on the first day of lockdown here. So he's a lockdown baby. Oh, it'll be good to talk about that because it doesn't sound like anything's going to change much. So it'll be good to, to, to hear what you have to say about that and, and, and how you all navigated things. Sure. So let's start with you. You want to talk about the three births, right? Yeah. Yeah. We might kind of, I don't know if you want to go through them in order or if we just kind of bounce between them. There's a lot to be said for the first and the third one in particular. Yeah. Well, let's start. Let's just start with the first and, um, and tell me about getting pregnant, the decision to get pregnant, that kind of thing, and, um, and how that went for you all. Yeah. Well, so the decision to get pregnant was not a decision to get pregnant, Yeah. <laughs> which was a... Uh, which is a definite shock. I, I actually can't even remember where I was when I found out. I mean, I may have just blanked it from my mind. But you know, Anna and I hadn't been together for that long. And it, it would be true to say that we'd had a, a kind of rocky time. So getting pregnant was not the obvious course of action uh, as an understatement. Um, and, I, and I guess that really forced a decision around yeah, what do we want to do here? Are we going to have this child? Are we going to commit to one another? Um, and, and we did. We decided, yeah, this is this is what we want. We're going to do this. I, I can remember really vividly, although I can't remember what, where I was when I found out, I, I do um, leadership development and exec coaching. And I can remember going 
to the US and working in New York with a client and, and actually needing almost reverse saying, look, I know I'm here for you, but you just need to talk to me about this for a bit. Uh, <laughs> And uh, needing them to counsel me through it. So it was a real shock. So how was that first pregnancy and and what kind of expectations did you have going in? Yeah, I mean, it it was strange because we weren't even living together at the time. So I suppose there was a lot of practical expectations around, you know, moving in together. We weren't even living together. So that was a big step. Mm -hmm. And then there was just some practical consideration. You know, my family and Anna's family are both quite religious. And, you know, as are we, but I suppose older generation, we're very much, you know, right, you guys need to get married right now. No pressure. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That that definitely wasn't the plan either. I mean, I, I can remember we told my parents that we were pregnant the day that they they were going to church that day to renew their wedding vows um so they i think they felt slightly hijacked but i remember <laughs> when i when i told my parents they they hugged anna and said you know welcome to the family we're delighted and, and we told anna's parents anna's mum hugged her and anna's dad cried and not good tears hmm. so it was it was quite an experience um but then i guess you know we then we, we moved in together we signed up for nct which is our kind of course here for parents for pregnancy in the UK and I know a lot of people have quite a good experience of NCT um, but we didn't have that great an experience I can really vividly remember the woman leading the course almost locking all the men in a room together and saying right find a date you guys are gonna you're gonna go for a drink and it was just really apparent looking around nobody wanted to meet up with one another and I think some of the women did get they stay in touch but I mean I guess also practically I, I didn't feel like we came away from that with you know a huge a huge amount of kind of insight or knowledge that would prove that helpful to us I guess we did it didn't prepare us for what happens if this all goes wrong um, and the, and it you know it did all go wrong um, so so that wasn't hugely valuable. I bought a book or someone gave me a book. I think a friend of mine gave me a book. It's called Pregnancy for Men by, by a guy called Mark Woods. And I, I, although I didn't particularly enjoy the tone of the book, it, it, I found it very helpful. It was kind of a week by week what to expect. And, you know, you, you read ahead of where your partner is. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really useful. You know, I kind of knew when Anna's energy would maybe be better. And, I, you know, I just followed the advice. It said, you know, book your wife a massage at this week. Okay, good. I'll do that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the tone of the book. Was it kind of like a treating you like you're dumb kind of a thing? Is that what was the deal with it for you? I think it was more that um, it was a bit laddish. Okay. I don't know if that's, you know, in, a, in the UK we say lad. It was a bit like, hey, guys, I know you're all used to going out, drinking and partying and, you know, like drinking, having curries and throwing out the lads. But right now you've got to do this baby thing. Um, which uh, wasn't my reality at that point of life anyway. So, uh, but, but then the advice in it was, was useful and practical and well thought through. That's good at least. So tell me about, you know, finding the provider. How did, what was the, what was the plan going in for birth? Yeah. So we don't, in the UK, you kind of don't find the provider. You, you know, you're assigned, you kind of, whichever hospital you're closest to, and then you get either a midwife or a team of midwives, um, so our first child, we had a team of midwives, and um, and and some of them would would, would be home visits, and, and some of them would involve going to the midwife for visits, um, and that, and that was a, a pretty good experience. We had a um, a lady called Dion for that for the most part, um, and she was good. Um, I remember, you know, we, I went to all the scans, and um, and it, you know, again, that was I, th- I think one of the my out, kind of abiding memories of going to the scans was I think until I walked into the room I had an assumption that just you get a healthy child and I just remember really vividly sitting there and realizing oh oh okay there's and I was like you know as someone whose job is coaching and therefore doing a lot of reading people uh, their expressions their emotions what's going on for them I was desperately trying to read what is this uh, the sonographer the ultrasound technician, what are, what are they noticing? What are they thinking? Are they, is, or is there something there? I remember really vividly kind of feeling a bit more anxious and I hadn't prepared myself for that feeling. Um, and so I, I, I think I've came out, I was quite grateful. Like, oh, okay. We do, you know, everything is fine. Um, 
so yeah, that that, uh, that really stands out vividly. Um, yeah, and then I suppose in terms of the other things that we did during the pregnancy, I, I am I am quite the planner, and my wife is not. So I was definitely <laughs> the one with the, the spreadsheet. I think I did the nesting for both of us. Uh-huh. Uh, I had the kind of like, here's all the list of things and let's go to the shops and test drive some buggies and, you know, we need a baby monitor and all of that things. I mean, I, I suppose it's one of my ways of maybe feeling like there's some sense of control around this thing. Um, but yeah, and I, I guess the care that we had, it felt all, all pretty, pretty good. I, th- I remember, I should have checked this with Anna, but I think um, all the way through, Anna was measuring quite big. A baby was measuring big, I should say, and so they 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 had they had a concern about that and about whether there was kind of some gestational diabetes going on, and I think they decided not again whether whether there was when I get to the birth, you know, you'll find out that it didn't it didn't quite go as planned, but I I think everything up to it was was on the whole pretty good. Yeah, well, let's talk about the birth. So, what was uh, I'm curious to know not just about you know. Uh, you know, the plan for it, uh, and then what, you know, what happened, but also, you know, you know, what you expected as far as your role, um, and then, and then how that changed as well, if it did. Yeah. So we had a birth plan and I, and that was good, you know, and the midwives had helped us put that together. And Anna was quite clear on, you know, that she wanted a water birth and how she wanted it to be that she didn't, you know, she didn't want to, have pain relief and she wanted to do it naturally herself and um she didn't want an epidural so I, we talked about you know my role was to advocate for that um and so you know i think having that plan was actually really helpful and so going in i think i had i had a sense that my may, maybe as well that i had a sense of my role being a bit more passive than it ended up being i remember my brother-in-law gave me what turned out to be absolutely useless advice. And it was no fault on him. Uh, it was because his, his, the birth of his children was totally different to the birth of mine. And he said, so you're going to need three things. One, you're going to want a fan uh, like to hold a partner because they're going to get hot. Two, you're going to want a tennis ball or something to put pressure uh-huh. on them to counterweight. And three, you're going to want to download some games to your phone because... <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna have a load of dead time in here because their, their labour is like forty hours, and I th- I remember trying all those things. I, I went near Anna with a fan and she kind of screamed, "Get away from me!" Uh, I, try, I tried to put a tennis ball on her and again got a similar response. And, and there was certainly never a moment where I could have even imagined kind of getting my phone out and thinking, "I'll oh, just play a bit of Tetris or whatever it was." So. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I guess maybe some of that advice had slightly prepared me as well. That I'd, I'd have a slightly more kind of that my role would be focused just on Anna, just on supporting her. But actually, what I hadn't really envisaged was how key my role would become in almost navigating some of the situations we found ourselves in and making decisions for us and knowing what Anna wanted and, and kind of being prepared to advocate for her. Um, and that's probably the biggest thing that I've taken away from all of the births of my children is just that your role is not just focused on your partner. That is just a, that is a big part of it. You need to be their champion and know what they want and be absolutely prepared to support them and maybe even challenge them if, you know, if they've asked you to do that. I want this. Don't let me off the hook. You know, so I remember with our third child, Anna, and said, don't let me get stuck lying down I need to be you know upright I know that's what I want so I had to be the one saying get off the bed <laughs> you told me to tell you this come on get up uh-huh. and uh, and that was good she was really grateful afterwards I should say for that um but I think the other bit of the role that I hadn't prepared for was just this interfacing with clinicians and, and you know nurses and being prepared to to champion or advocate to them and understand a complex situation and to kind of help make sense of what was happening so that i mean i guess if a birth goes to plan maybe that's less of a thing but certainly two of our three didn't and i felt much more equipped the third time around than the first time around yeah all right so tell me about um uh, that's an interesting line that we should talk about and explore uh tell me about the the first birth and then maybe we'll 
um, talk a bit about the second, but I'm, I am curious now about what you've said, you know, being prepared for the third better after the first and in that regard. Yeah, sure. Well, so yeah, I mentioned already, so we had a plan for a water birth and we, we thought we'd got quite lucky because in London where we live, there's, uh, one of the big well-known hospitals is called King's. You know, you know, you're going to get some of the best care in the country if you go there. And Kings had just opened a new uh, birthing center with new birth pools. I think we were, you know, no more than the 20th people to have used it. It was brand new. It just opened. And it was beautiful. This room was great. So, you know, that was the plan was to get in there. But when we first got to hospital, well, actually, when we first started having contractions, I, I remember that really vividly because we weren't married. And we'd actually by this point got engaged and I was doing the guest invitations while Anna was having contractions. <laughs> Way to multitask. And I remember desperately trying to finish these at home and just, if I could just get this document done. And it, and it is in some ways testament to Anna, my wife, is very tough and very, has a, 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 I think every woman who has a child is, by the way, Anna has a immense capacity for uh, enduring pain without really complaining which actually turns out to be a key bit of the stories because the the medical professionals were always amazed by how far along she was because she wasn't she didn't seem to be exhibiting the kind of typical signs that they would expect to be you know someone who is like you know kind of transition or you know so eight centimeters dilated there was, there was always a oh gosh that's taken us by surprise because when we first got to, got to hospital we went in the night in a taxi and we got in there and we got stuck in a room in triage it must have been for about three hours in the middle of the night and Anna was you know being first pregnancy first labor I think it really shocked her how um how hard and how painful it was and we hadn't really invested in things that we did for the second and the third like hypnobirthing birthing you know breathing techniques and those things really served as well but this one I think both of us underestimated it um but I could tell because of where she was that I, I she, she was kind of saying I, I think this is progressing pretty quickly and I you know I ended up having to go out and just grab someone and say, you know, you need to, you need to get in here. We need to get out of this room. You know, we need to get into the birth pool if this is going to happen. Um, and I had to be pretty pushy in a pleasant way that I think we just got in a busy period of the night. Um, I found out afterwards that they'd had um, a, a woman had lost her child and that at the same time. So there's a lot of attention elsewhere in the hospital. Um, so we, eventually we get into this birth pool. Then the midwife, our midwife arrives and that, that was all great. We're in this room. It's brand new. It's got kind of low lights and everything feels very calm. And Anna's in the pool. Um, and obviously it's not that it's easy by any stretch of the imagination. But I thought this is what a great way to, you know, welcome into the world our, our first child. But then it just seemed to go on for some time. And I could tell, again, as someone who kind of tries to tune into people, I could tell that the midwife, Dion, was getting agitated and that. You know, I asked her and she said, it's just taking too long. I think there's a problem. You know, this has been going on. I had no idea, by the way, at this point that you should not be uh, 10 centimeters dilated and still pushing uh, for more than, I can't remember exactly what they say, is it two hours maximum? Um, but by this point, it had already been coming up for an hour and a half. And so Dion says, right, we, this isn't happening. Baby's got stuck we need to get you out of this birth pool and we need to get around to the labor ward. And so she calls up the labor ward and then I can tell again, she's very angry and she puts the phone out and she says, turns out we've got to go to them. They don't come to us. I'm like, that's, that's crazy. She said, yeah, there's some teething problems with this interface. It turns out we were the first people who'd been emergency transferred from this new birthing pool into the labor ward and they just didn't have that protocol, which is kind of crazy to, to imagine that. Um, and so she calls yeah. up the hospital looking for a hospital porter. Uh, it's nighttime. There's no porter. We can't get to you until 30 minutes, which ended up with uh, Dion as a kind of very kind of steely, determined woman, like very angrily telling them what she thought and then having to compose herself, say, we've got to walk. 
And so uh, th- I, looking back on it, I mean, this is crazy, but Anna, 10 centimeters dilated, having con- very, you know, very intense contractions with the baby stuck and then had to walk, get out of the pool, get a gown on, walk around the public part of the hospital. <sighs> yeah. She's going from pillar to pillar having contractions and just like one pillar to stop just thinking about it makes me very emotional yeah and then we got you know we got into the labor ward and i remember that feeling like oh gosh we made it you know it's gonna be okay the doctors are here but again i didn't know what i didn't know and i suppose i could understand with hindsight why they really wanted to give anna the chance of having a natural birth but anna's father my father-in-law is a is a gp a doctor and he um he was messaging me saying what's happening i mean this has been four hours now um and so again i didn't realize that that was really you know that not a good idea to to because the baby could be getting distressed and, and that's what they became concerned about and amidst all of this anna had just found the pain too difficult to cope with at this point and so they you know they went to give her an epidural and they did that in a rush and then I kind of looked around and I saw like Anna's just lying in a pool of blood and I saw that they hadn't put the epidural in correctly and so now she's just pumping blood and it's literally pumping everywhere. Um, so I had to kind of call the emergency, get them to come back. She's now lying in this pool of other blood from the epidural um, and, it, and, you know, ultimately the consultant who's there said, look, you know, I think we're going to have to pull the plug on this and I, I said, look, I, I know, I'm just going to say the same thing. This this has surely been going on too long. And I think they were then monitoring baby's distress levels and said, you know, baby's getting distressed, heartbeat's getting irregular, you know, emergency C-section. So then, right, okay, <laughs> we go again. The, 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 funny, the funny bit in all this, there is a funny moment where, again, because King's is a teaching hospital, um, you know, and I, I don't blame them for this because they didn't know what was happening. But we had this moment where... Uh, Another consultant brought these kind of five trainee doctors in and said, would it be okay if we came and observed for a few minutes? And I said, "Uh, no, certainly not. But Anna, who is by now had lots of gas and air and the epidural has kicked in and is feeling much better. It's like, come in. (laughs) You're welcome. So we ended up with this room full of all these people as well. It was really bizarre and very stressful, um, quite comical in some ways um but then you know we get rushed in for this emergency c-section which is you know i'm still at this point in my swim shorts <laughs> because oh, yeah. you know, I've, i haven't got changed i've just got a t-shirt and my swim shorts i've got to put my gown on and get gowned up and get into theater so i mean literally we toured every bit of that hospital for this birth um and the this the give me i can't remember the the right term for the the consultant who conducts the cesarean, but she um, was amazing and and very professional, very calming, very precise, kind of very much like, don't worry. It was the first time I think we felt somebody's in control and this is is all going to work out. And she was exactly what we needed. She was friendly, but she was, you know, very, very kind of concise. And she actually... But by bizarre coincidence, we had a mutual friend, uh, which we discovered, uh, I discovered through talking to her. <laughs> and she actually, when she did the cesarean, um, she said to us, which is amazing, would you like me to make a video for you? And I, I said, yeah. So I gave her my camera, I got a decent SLR camera, and she actually made a video, which is something that we really treasure, you know, because yeah. I, I suppose I'd imagine I'd be making the video and then therefore wouldn't be on it. But actually, it's both of us. Uh, on this video so that was like this really at the end of it all um this really beautiful moment I, I'm, I'm skipping over deliberately the details of the cesarean because i remember being quite squeamish and when she asked me if i'd like to look i just i, I did glimpse and i regretted it <laughs> uh and and did not want to go and look at what they were doing over there um because i i think especially i was just quite exhausted by that point um and i was just really delighted to meet this child and I just remember that being just a such a such a joyful moment I've got a picture of Anna just looking so happy and peaceful 
Um, but that moment didn't last long, unfortunately. I don't know if you want me to go on and tell you what happened next, but it would be nice if that was the end of the traumatic events, but it actually wasn't. All right. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and, and talk about what happened next. So I guess that at that point, we, you know, you kind of naturally take this kind of like, oh, you exhale and it's, we can, you know, we're, we're done. This thing is done. That was That was intense. But as soon as we moved into the recovery room, the midwife changed. We had two midwives in the room and one midwife said, that baby looks very pale and shaky to me. And it was interesting. Our midwife, Dion, was exhausted too. You could just see she'd been with us all night. I can't, I don't know how many hours it'd been, but, you know, at this point, going many, many hours. And she said, I'm sure it's nothing. And this other midwife, she's called Janet, was insistent. And it was amazing that she was so insistent. No, there's something not right here. I am going to check this baby's bloods. And so she took the bloods and it came out as uh, 0.9, which is, I mean, anything under one is, you know, very, day, you know, you could die. And and a couple of the people who said, that machine must be wrong. That, that cannot be right. She said, you know, I'll do it again did it again and it came out as 0.8 and at that point it was oh right let's give ourselves back up what what's happening and someone just said this is you know severe um excuse me yeah i i remember as well i had this t-shirt on <laughs> i remember being quite outraged that um although again with hindsight a great great you know kind of bit of action the midwife said the baby's shaking baby's cold um, and so cut my T-shirt open without asking me, yeah. <laughs> just cut and just stuffed Alara, my daughter, down um, the, my T-shirt. Um, and Anna was still in recovery at, at this point. So she, wa- I think, wasn't quite conscious of what was happening. And then they rushed her up to, um, we call it SCABU, Special Care Baby Unit. You know, I think you call it NICU, do you? The NICU, yeah. Um, and then that, that was then the journey of the next three and a half weeks was kind of, figuring out what was wrong and dealing with all of that, which it turns out she had a quite a rare illness called hyperinsulinism, which is essentially the opposite of diabetes, but quite rare. Um, and so her blood sugars were dangerously low and uh, she ended up in, in intensive care. And yeah, again, that was just quite a shock coming home every night and leaving your child in hospital because we weren't allowed to stay. Yeah, It was really difficult. Um, but well, we got great care. I think at that point, I'd say the care, we actually did get great. I wouldn't say the care was great up to that point, but from that point onwards, you might have heard of, there's a hospital in London called Great Ormond Street, which is a kind of world famous hospital for children. And oh. the consultant yeah. who was seconded from there and they, she, they figured out this illness and um, yeah, Alara made a, a recovery from it, which is amazing. Um, but it was a pretty rough start to parenting, hey? <laughs> yeah. I could say, what what did you do in that in that time, uh, both to, you know, support yourself and support your your partner? Was there anything that I mean that you found any anything you could do other than just be through it together? Or yeah, I mean, I think there's some really practical things like um, when I left, the, I had to leave the hospital that day and go and I was just like thinking, what what would Anna need? You know, and I brought fairy lights because I knew that she was going to be in hospital for a few days. And I brought her some new clothes and um, I bought her, I can't remember if we had an iPad then or, or not. But, you know, I very much was thinking ahead, what is it she needs now um, very practically to support her? She couldn't, um, the, you know, again, there was no provision in the hospital for her to get from the recovery ward up to um, the special care baby unit up to NICU um, and she couldn't walk. So, I mean, it sounds a bit kind of frontier-esque, but I literally had to go and find a wheelchair because there wasn't one available. And I eventually kind of loaned one from the, I, I just went around looking for empty wheelchairs saying, this is the situation. Can, can we please have a wheelchair? Um, so I was, I was quite resourceful. I quite enjoyed that part. <laughs> well, good, and yeah, good for you. I can't believe that they didn't have a way for that to happen. I know. I know, and it, yeah, again, it's it's shocking to think that. Um, but again, it's because they would, they would, for, I don't know, they don't, they don't, they just that gap of the recovery while Anna couldn't walk, and the inability for her to sleep on the same floor uh, as the as the NICU unit. Um, so, and and I guess through all of it, then just becoming, 
you know, trying to balance becoming the advocate for Anna as she's recovering. Um, also making sure that she's got time with Alara and then doing a lot of figuring out like what is wrong with this, with our baby. It took a while to get a diagnosis and just speaking to all the different medical professionals, building relationships. I think it, you have to be kind of friendly, but challenging. You know, I, I want to build a relationship with you, but I also need to know what's happening and I need some information here. And we did build some really good relationships in that NICU unit. And, and I think they, they served us really well um and it, as well as you know them looking out for anna and take, you know making sure that she was okay so um and and i suppose yeah just being i was definitely very mindful of um you know when her milk comes in after a couple of days she's going to be feeling a bit down and what can i do to to kind of be aware of that and encouraging and you know get people to call at that time get people to send them messages I did a lot of coordinating, I think, and that I think that I took trying to take a lot of the pressure off Anna. Yeah, I think she really. Well, we talked about it, and she told me that was one of the things that she she really appreciated. I bet. So, tell me, how did this experience inform your preparation for the next two births? Well, I guess I had no expectation that it would be straightforward, but I also realised that you know it's really good to be. Um, to be prepared and to talk through different situations and to try and anticipate how that might be. Um, certainly throughout the pregnancy, to be really kind of advocating around, you know, we have a we have a sense that because our first child was measuring, she was so big. I mean, she was, you know, again, I should know this, but like eight, eight and a half pounds. Or I don't know if you do uh, the same measurements as we do, so I'd have to convert that basically she was really big yeah there's a pretty good case that gestational diabetes was missed um because of the 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 rapid acceleration of size at the end we were very much looking for that we were also really advocating for a natural birth for you know for vbat and for for that to be possible um and again there was we got good support for that um from from the midwives and and then from the the hospital staff so i I guess we just had a pretty clear picture of what we wanted but we maybe just knew a bit more of what to pay attention to um and the 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 conversations to have with the you know i think the first time around we were a bit passive because we just assume well you just kind of leave it with people you tell them what you want and then they just kind of make it happen (laughs) Next time around, you, there's a lot of moving parts and people don't know everything. And you have to, it's really helpful if you are one of the people who can kind of be informed and informing these other people about situations rather than just kind of being a bit of a passive recipient of whatever you get. That's really good advice. So where do you want to go from here? Uh, I know you said that your second, the second birth was a VBAC, right? Uh, yeah, he was, uh, Anna was 10 days o- over due so they were recommending a c-section but we did again have to do some advocating and found that there was a consultant in the hospital is willing to induce so actually we went into hospital expecting to have a c-section because they'd told us if you go more than 10 days, it was more than 10 days sorry if you go more than 10 days then kind of game over and we're not going to do an induction because um and again this, you have to forgive me, my memory is a bit hazy, but I think they don't like to induce when you've got when you've had a C-section because it's more of an intense birth process and there's a, a risk there. Um, but we found someone who's willing to, and said, no, you tick all the boxes, everything's healthy, I'm willing to induce. And that one was quite funny because we'd gone in thinking, well, we're we'll, we'll having a C-section at two o'clock to do you want to do this? Because if you want to do it, we're going to do it now. <laughs> so that ended up, okay, um, yeah, let's, let's do this. So it was a bit on the spot of, okay, well, let's, but we kind of knew what, I think we knew what we wanted and it did all happen quite, quite quickly. And I just, I just remember that time being that they were just amazed that Anna was so in control. We'd done hypnobirthing and she was so in control. And I was saying to them, look, I, I know my wife, I know that this baby's almost here. And they were saying, it just, it just doesn't seem like it. And I had to ask them to examine it. And they said, oh my gosh, yeah, baby's coming. Um, you know, and, and we had to go straight into the room. And, and, and that was a good lesson as well of you do need to just trust your instinct. And if you know your partner and you know, you can tell, you know, the signs, 
um, then you know you know better it potentially than them um, and so that I just remember how flawed they were like Anna how are you so in control this is incredible and that was very useful with the third because I mean <laughs> that it, it was even even quicker um, and I it is quite funny they told us when we got to hospital with Bodhi this was just in March this year they said to us um, yeah we knew we knew that you were probably going to be kind of quite straightforward when on the phone you said well I'm just going to do the kids bedtime before we come in even though Anna's having control (laughs) (laughs) okay all right come when you're ready yep (laughs) the kids bedtime and then we went in and and again Anna we we were in a triage room and I, I could tell that it was you know, coming quite quickly. And I said, Anna, you've got to get up. You told me you do not want to do this on your back. You've got to be standing up. Um, and, and I again had to go and negotiate and say, if you, you need to trust me and that I'm sure baby's coming. And so they, they got us in to the room at St. We're at St. Thomas's hospital this time. Actually, I'm right by the hospital in case you can hear a siren on the audio. My office is actually next to St. Thomas's hospital in London. Um, and, uh, and so we went in this room and Anna just went in the bathroom and this was the start of lockdown. So it was the first day of lockdown. I remember thinking this ridiculous thought of, um, oh, cause you know, I'm quite worried about COVID with the baby. I, I better just disinfect Anna's hand. So I, uh, Anna went in the bathroom and I, at the moment I was talking to the midwife when she came in and I thought, I'll just go and disinfect. And the I went in and put some kind of disinfectant gel and I went in and fully intending to just say to Anna darling could you could you just lift your hand up for a minute because you're on the floor and she looked at me she said the baby is hanging out between my legs (laughs) I didn't even say never mind just rub the gel into my trousers reach around and I had to catch Bodhi as he came out and again (laughs) midwife was just a gobsmack uh, yeah I mean it went probably he was he arrived within two hours of arriving in the hospital um and literally just in the toilet i was holding on to him as we were trying to then get him out and so i didn't quite deliver him but it was still quite a special moment so yeah. funny and laughing at me afterwards what were you thinking <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about COVID and disinfecting your hands yeah so yeah what was that like um as far as what the hospital protocols were around COVID? Well, it would have been okay, but again, so so what happened with Bodhi was I, I changed his first nappy and I just looked and thought, that's blood. And I said to the midwife, I, I don't know if this is just from the birth, but I wouldn't say so. I think there's some blood in his stool. And, you know, I know we've been talking a while, so long story short, he ended up again getting moved to special care, to uh, NICU. And and that did trigger quite a traumatic response for Anna. I think of, I've just given birth and, again, I'm separated from my child, who, again, is we don't know what's wrong, and, again, they're in special care. Yeah. But what made it really difficult was I was not allowed in by this point. So I was not allowed to see Anna because COVID had shut down the um, the birth center. So I was, after the birth, I was not allowed to go where Anna was and I could only see her in the corridor and we weren't allowed into the um, special care unit together either. We could only go in one at a time. So even though you had just helped deliver the baby. Yeah, it was crazy. As soon as we delivered the baby, like, and then Anna moved from the kind of birthing unit to the recovery unit. It's a totally different set of rules. You can no longer, you can no longer come in here, and that was just very difficult for Anna and other mothers to be isolated without any visitors allowed. Um, and Anna, and my wife, is a very kind of very calm and mild mannered person, but she ended up having to really stand up for someone else in there who was a first time mum who has been you know treated really badly and who desperately needed some support. And Anna you know felt like she had to kind of step in and say you know clearly this woman's not okay you need to give her a break you need someone to come and help her um but it was right at the start of lockdown and so it, it was very draconian um and uh, yeah it's very hard for Anna again trying to coordinate people to call her bringing things that she'd need downloading things onto her ipad like books 
um, and trying to work out what was wrong with Bodhi. And it, it turned out what was wrong was luckily no one it was severe. As with Alara, he had just an extreme dairy intolerance. Oh. Um, and so that was a little bit more manageable if he's out within four or five days. Um, and that, you know, he didn't have any ongoing problems. But, uh, you know, I certainly would feel for any first time parent going into that situation, if you're unprepared, I don't know, again, I'm sure every country, every hospital is different, but just certainly that kind of the time when you need the most support, she ended up most isolated. Yeah. Holy cow. Um, it's been a lot of excellent <laughs> advice. Uh, I think just all that works just generally as well. Um, from your, from your three births here. What, um, what have I not asked that you want to talk about? I mean, I, I guess there's something to be said for just the value of, of talking about these experiences. Yeah. I do with friends who have had children, you know, I will, I will give them advice about, um, I don't have any advice for them about how the birth might go. I'm not going to tell them to download a game or take a fan or any of that stuff but just you know I I guess that when when things don't go as planned being able to adapt and respond and you know I think that's probably my takeaways you know and, and maybe the other thing was just there's always always people who have it far worse you know, I think one of the most profoundly impacting experiences of my life was the 25 days that we spent with Alara in the special care baby unit in Niku, because not because of how severely ill she was, but because in comparison to a lot of other babies in there, she wasn't that severely ill. You know, we became friends with parents who, what we had one set of parents whose um, child had been born prematurely and whose uh, lungs were the wrong side of their diaphragm and you know that is just the most horrible situation and, and I, I guess you kind of come out of that with just a profound respect for parents appreciation for the, the level of care that you that hospital staff really do have even when they don't get it right um like I, I am much more forgiving of the system might not quite work the way you want it to but people will really care And it's not a question of whether people care. It's a question of can you get across to them what they need to know in order to give you the right. Um, And I think that's kind of my takeaway from it is people always care. There's always people in a worse position, still always kind of grateful for how we came out of it. And that actually it isn't a bad thing to advocate and to be, you know, no one else should be as interested in the care that your child gets and your wife gets as you. Um, and that's okay to kind of go into it. Like I, I have a really key role to play here, and it's and it's way bigger than I ever imagined at the start. Yeah. Well, Andy, thank you so much for coming on. This is a, a helpful kind of perspective shifting episode. I think it's going to be really helpful for a lot of our partners who are walking into situations and just don't know what to expect. I mean, hopefully start preparing early and often for for a wide variety of things i guess yeah and and you know talk i think there's a i'll say this and then i'll, I'll stop talking i think there's a fine line between you don't want to i don't want to ever scare people and and you certainly when people going in for their first child i'm really mindful of i certainly don't want to project my experience onto them or project anxiety onto them um, and I, so I think it is a fine line between kind of it's, it's not about worrying people or anxiety. It's just about being alive to the situation and being really prepared that, that there is no definitive path through this and you might have to kind of navigate it yourself. And I, I think that's the helpful thing to focus on is so don't, there's no anxiety needed. All of mine were like a kind of true kind of happy ending. Great kids, all healthy all really kind of well adjusted and you know thriving um and there's just many ways to get there um and there's ways you could probably make it a lot easier for yourself and your partner yeah that makes sense well thank you so much i appreciate it andy oh it's been good for me to talk about it so thanks for having me on richard i've really enjoyed the conversation thanks again to andy for sharing and to our listener supporters over at patreon for making this possible until next friday take care